All right, good morning. Are there any questions on the last lectures? Anybody have any comments or questions? I believe, has, has anybody had difficulty finding the, the course material? So I should have um, all the lectures, notes, um, except for perhaps the last one, uh, which I just sent in to have posted. They should be up on the, the web. Everybody's found where those are. I've got a number of comments, too, about um, uh, the slides. I'll comment again that um, the last, the population genetics lectures did not have any PowerPoint, or I use keynote, keynote slides that uh, were posted, so there should only be lecture notes there. And some people have complained, once again, about the quality of the, um, of the slides, especially in the webcast. And I'm sorry about that, but you know, there's, there are some advantages to showing up live um, to the lectures. Okay, I can't make it too easy for you. Okay, well, without any questions, I want to move on to a lecture today that I suspect none of you will really be interested in. I mean, you'll probably just want to sleep through this. It's about, it's about sex. And, um, and many of you probably already said, you know, already thought, well, I've already kind of had this lecture, you know. You're saying, haven't we already done this? I mean, you, I don't, you may remember that very, very awkward conversation or speech your parents gave you probably about a decade ago. It, they always start off, you know, when a man and a woman love each other very much, that starts off like that, right? This is not that lecture, all right? <laughs> After I'm done with you, you'll be so uninterested in sex that there'll be no more parties or anything at the, at the campus for a while. All right, so what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about the evolutionary explanation for sex. And it's important that, I, that we, we go over, I mean, first of all, the evolutionary explanation of sex, I think, is an interesting one. As you'll see, there are co some costs associated with sex, so it has been a real enigma of why, we act, why so many organisms actually undergo sexual reproduction. So I'll try to give the ex evolutionary explanation for that. And this is also going to be a building lecture for the next one, in which we'll talk about uh, uh, sexual selection, so this sort of explanation for why you see traits out there, especially uh, traits in males that seem so maladaptive. Long tail feathers on bird, male birds, for instance. Why do, these, why do these animals have traits that seem obviously maladaptive, that is not good to have in terms of just survival and re reproduction? So this lecture is going to have a couple parts. Um, I'm going to talk about what it is, okay, and not the mechanics. There's no, nothing lurid here. It's just going to be, uh, from our perspective as evolutionary biologists, let's just dissect sex away and go right to the point. What does sex accomplish? I want to talk about um, some of the variety of, of ways in which organisms accomplish sexual reproduction. It's an evolved trait. It's a trait that continues to evolve, and so there's a lot of variation in how organisms do it, so to speak. I want to talk about the cost, and then I want to talk about the evolutionary explanation. So that's my goal for this lecture, and hopefully I'll be able to go through it all. Okay, so let's start off with what it is. And so, once again, if you're interested in the, um, if you're interested in the, in the details of meiosis and uh, gamete formation, we're not going to be going through that in this lecture. Um, this is going to be kind of a high-end, high-level type of overview of what sex actually accomplishes. Your textbook actually has quite a bit of detail on how meiosis occurs and how, um, uh, how gamete formation occurs. If you're really interested, you should read that part of your textbook, or um, you'll get it in Biology 1A, I imagine, as well. Okay? From our perspective, we're going to just look at a cell as a very simple thing. It's just a circle, all right? And this is the nucleus of a cell. I should mention that we're going to be dealing with diploid organisms. All right, that is to say, organisms that have uh, two pairs of chromosomes, each, each copy of the gene is doubled up, and do they get one from mom, one from dad. We talk about diploid organisms. And a nucleus, of course, is interesting from our perspective because that's where the genetic material is. So what these squiggly lines represent are chromosomes. So that's a pair of chromosomes. This would be the centromere that actually, the, you know, the centromere that actually holds the two chromosomes together. Um, here's a squiggly pair of chromosomes. And here's another pair of chromosomes that's straight. Okay. 
Now we imagine let's, that we have you know, this, the chromosomes are where all the genes are contained, obviously. And we're going to consider one locus on this chromosome and one locus on this chromosome. We'll call this the A locus, and we have a big A allele on one of the chromosomes and a little a allele on the other chromosome. And on this chromosome, we'll have um, this other chromosome pair. We'll have another locus, which we'll call the B locus. And we imagine that one of the chromosomes, maybe from mom, had a big B allele, and the other chromosome from dad perhaps had a little B chromosome. Now, the first important point about um, sexual reproduction is that during the, during the formation of gametes, this is, there's a process in which gametes are formed, you have a reduction division in which the gametes get one, one of the two chromosomes, one from mom and one from dad. Okay? And the probability that any one of these two chromosomes goes into any specific gamete is one half. It's a fair process. Okay, now there, I say it's a fair process. There are examples out there in nature where it's not a fair process, where some gene tries to take over the, the formation of gametes and, and represent itself in the gametes at a higher frequency. We're not talking about these examples. For the most part, um, the, which of these two chromosomes goes into the gametes is fair. So what types of gametes can be formed? So here, here's an example of a gamete. A gamete, of course, um, just to remind you, is an egg or a sperm. So we can get, we're going to get one copy of the squiggly chromosome and one copy of the straight chromosome in the gamete. Now, one of the types of chromosomes that can be formed is one that has a big A allele on this chromosome and a big B allele on this chromosome. Okay. So that's one of the types of gametes that can be formed. But there's, there's three other gametes that can be formed as well. Here's one of them. Let's see, here's a squiggly. So we can have the big A and the little b. We can have... There's the squiggly chromosome, the straight. We can have the little a and the big B. And the last guy that can be formed, I'm writing too big. Um, I'll just write it here. So it'd be little a and little b. So this, this process of independent assortment process of independent assortment of the chromosomes into the gametes can create a different type of, a variety of different gametes. Okay. Note that um, if you have a union of two gametes of this sort, little a, little b, you're going to have an individual that's homozygous, little a, little a at one locus, and little b, little b at the other locus, right? That is now, th that is potentially a genotype combination that's not found in the parents. Maybe it's two heterozygous, maybe it's two individuals like this that mate. Okay, two individuals that have big A, that are heterozygous at both of these loci for these two chromosomes. Maybe you have two parents that, that mate that are of this sort, and yet they can form young offspring that are homozygous for little a or homozygous for big A. Right? That you can get combinations of genes in the offspring that, aren't, that are not present in the parents through this process of independent assortment. Okay, so this is one, one of the themes you'll see in this lecture is that Sexual reproduction uh, causes variation in the offspring. So you actually see more variation in the offspring than you might have seen in the parents in this case. So that is assortment, independent assortment. Um, once again, causing gametes, and in, in if the, you have the union of these gametes, you can cause uh, individuals to be formed that are vary quite a bit from the parents. The other process I want to talk about occurs during meiosis, during this reduction division, uh, forming gametes, it's called recombination. And in this case, I want to talk about what happens on one chromosome. So here we have our chromosome pair. And let's imagine we have, on one of the chromosomes, maybe this is the chromosome from dad, we have a big A here and a little a over here. Over here we have a big B and little b. Now with just independent assortment alone, you cannot break up the big A, the, the association between the big A allele and the big B allele. Those two alleles, without any other process going on, are stuck together on the same chromosome, as are the little a and the little b. So the gametes that would be formed using independent assortment alone would always have the big A with the big B. Now you might, if, if you have other chromosomes in the genome, if you have other loci on those, you still would benefit from reassortment or independent assortment, but not if they're stuck on the same chromosome. 
So recombination is this process that actually allows the chromosome arms to exchange. So you have this process called crossing over, and it really is crossing over. You have this chromosome, basically, you have a, a break form, and it basically reattaches to this chromosome over here. So the, so the chromosomes that can be formed through, the, through recombination of these two um, chromosomes are the following. You can have big A with little b, and you can have little a with big B. These are the two chromosomes that, fair, that, that are, are created through recombination of these two chromosomes if the recombination event occurs between the two. Now, there's, of course, two other chromosomes that can be, that can be formed. Um, we can still have big A and with big B and little a with little b. These are the two chromosomes that, um, oops, that are formed if you do not have a crossing over event between the two chromosomes or if you have, I guess, an even number of crossing over events between the two chromosomes, right? Now, are there any questions about uh, recombination and, and independent assortment? Again, um, recombination, you might see, also can cause variation in the types of offspring that are created. Right? If you have the fertilization of gametes, so now let's just put these into gametes. So this is one gamete, here's another gamete, and so forth you can actually have gametes that are formed that have now a little b associated with them. And so you can actually have individuals that would be perhaps uh, heterozygous for big A and little b, which could not have been created before. Again, more variation created in the offspring. This is the common theme you see with sexual reproduction. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about what it is. Okay? From our perspective as evolutionary biologists, all we care about is that sexual reproduction causes independent assortment and recombination, which means that the offspring are potentially more variable genetically. You have more, more variation on which natural selection can operate. Now, a little bit about the variety. So, as I mentioned, um, sex, sexual reproduction is an, an evolved trait, and there's a wide variety of ways in which organisms um, reproduce out there. And that's what I want to go over now. Um, I think I'll just label these points sequentially. So the first thing I want to point out is the difference between isogamous species and anisogamous species. So isogamy versus anisogamy. Okay. So isogamous species are ones in which the gametes that are formed are the same size. And as you might imagine, Anisogamous species are ones in which you have a, a difference in the size of the gametes that, are, that different individuals form. So, uh, for instance, in humans, males and females uh, form gametes that are vastly different in size. I believe, like, over a thousand or a million times, the eggs, you know, a thousand times at least bigger than the, the sperm. So, you have big gametes, and you have little small gametes. By definition, the female are the individuals that create the big gametes. So these are, by definition, females, and these are, by definition, males, which kind of gives you another, another way of determining whether the person you're looking at is a male or female, if you're ever in doubt. Just if you can get a hold of the gametes, you have a surefire way of figuring out if they're male or female now. So it's a very useful class from that perspective, too. Okay. Now, there are, there are some species, most species out there are anisogamous. We're an example, mammals, most species are. There are a few isogamous species. Algae uh, produce gametes that are roughly the same size. And a lot of different fungi also produce gametes that are about the same size as each other. Now, this, this point, I mean, this is maybe an obvious point to you, but this point will become more important when we talk about uh, sexual selection. It turns out that females, because they, they're the ones that produce the bigger gametes, invest a lot more in reproduction than males. Okay, and that sets an, up an asymmetry in which the females can be the choosy sex and the males are, are well, they're not choosy. Okay, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. So just remember isogamy and anisogamy, it seems like an obvious point, but it has important repercussions um, evolutionarily. So that's the first point I wanted to make. Okay. I also have...
case. So you also have cases in which species either have separate sexes, obviously we're examples of that, or um, species that are hermaphroditic. That is to say that a single individual can produce both sperm and eggs. Examples of hermaphroditic species, things like peas, um, can form both male and female gametes. Um, banana slugs, a lot of slugs and, and mollusks can also do the same thing. If you're familiar with UC Santa Cruz's um, uh, mascot, the banana slug, that's a hermaphroditic species. Okay. Now there's also, you should also realize that um, with hermaphrodites, you can have, uh, they can either, they can of, often hermaphroditic species, they can self-fertilize. That is to say, a single individual can fertilize itself. It can take a, a one of its eggs and one of its sperm and, and fertilize itself. Um, examples of, of uh, self-fertilizing species are things like peas, which can be self-fertilized. Uh, banana slugs and, and lots of others cannot self-fertilize. They have to still find another individual, and then they can exchange eggs and sperm appropriately to make, make uh, offspring. You should not confuse hermaphroditic species, or you know, the, this, this mode of reproduction with um, cloning. That is to say, we'll talk about this in a moment, but you know, individuals that um, are asexual, asexually reproducing often, or they'll produce offspring that are genetically identical to the mom. Okay? Hermaphroditic species, because the eggs and, and sperm are still undergo independent assortment and um, recombination, the individuals that are formed in hermaphroditic species are not identical to one another. The, si the, the offspring are not identical. So don't, don't get this confused with cloning. Okay. you're wondering why there's a long silence while I'm writing things down, it turns out I can't write and speak at the same time, so just sort of by necessity. So the, the next thing I wanted to talk about briefly is genetic versus environmental sex determination. Now, the species you're familiar with, and you've, you've learned about, if you've learned about this in, in high school biology, for instance, you think about the genetic sex determining mechanisms. That is to say, uh, humans, for instance, have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 22 of those chromosomes are what are called autosomal. And one of the pairs is called the sexual, the sex chromosomes. And in mammals, those sex chromosomes come in two flavors. So the autosomal chromosomes, they look identical to one another. Okay, at least if you were to look under a microscope, they, they look identical, the pairs do. The sex chromosomes differ in size. And one of them, the larger chromosome, is called the X chromosome, and the smaller chromosome is called the Y chromosome. You should remember, of course, that these are just labels. If you, you know, if you look at the chromosomes through a microscope, they don't literally look like X's and Y's. It's just a label that was applied to them. The big chromosome is the X, the little chromosome is the Y. And in humans and lots of other mammals, the XX individuals, they become females. And the XY individuals become males. This is all stuff you probably know. Um, just as an aside, just to throw another term at you, the males are said to be the heterogametic sex. That is to say, the the gametes that the males form are, can be potentially different, right? Because some of the gam some of the sperm will have a, an X chromosome, and some of the sperm will have a Y chromosome. Those sperm that go on to fertilize an egg the individual will become male, obviously, because they, 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 the X will, uh, will pair with a Y. Now, not all species are like this. Birds, for instance, it's the females that are the heterogametic sex. Butterflies, the females are the heterogametic sex. So, in these other types of species, um, once again, the, the, the sex chromosomes are labeled, but they get the label Z and W. And it's the ZZ individuals that become um, males, and the ZW individuals become the females. As I said, the, the females are the type, the individuals that form two different types of gametes, that they're, they are the heterogametic sex. Sorry? 
This would be, so this would be an example of birds and butterflies. So, so sex determining mechanisms can evolve and, and there's a lot of interest, frankly, um, in the field right now about how sex chromosomes evolve and it's really been only in the last 10 years where people have been able to study how sex chromosomes evolve in sort of a molecular genetic basis and there's a woman in our department, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Doris Backtrog, who studies the evolution of sex chromosomes. It's, it's a very um, interesting field. But anyways, uh, this is just to point out that sex chromosomes can evolve and that there are different mechanisms, different ge uh, genetic sex determining mechanisms out there. Now, what about this environmental sex determination? Well, it turns out that some species don't have genetic sex determination. The, the sex that you turn into de is determined by the temperature at which the egg is incubated. Okay? Now, in the last lecture, I believe I, I talked about the experimental evolution. I showed two pictures, one of Holly Wickman, who is from uh, University of Idaho in Moscow, and the other photo, other photo was of Jim Bull, who's at the University of Texas at Austin. Jim Bull, Jim and Holly, Jim now studies experimental evolution in viruses, but his career started as a herpetologist. The, the herpetologists are people that study amphibians and reptiles and snakes. And he is the one that, did, that discovered that, thing, that organisms like turtles and crocodiles, that the sex is determined by the environment. So a pretty remarkable discovery. And in turtles, I always get this confused, but in turtles, I believe males, are formed at low temperature, is that right? Yes. And in crocodiles and alligators, it's just the opposite. Males form at high temperature. And of course, the question comes up, you know, if you have a cold season or a warm season, why aren't all the individuals formed of the same, same sex. And it turns out that the threshold at which the, the crossing, the, the, the critical temperature which above which you have males or females um, is, is basically around the nest temperature. So the nests are much more constant in temperature than um, you know, the ambient temperature of the, of the air. That's just an that's a ecological question, but that it is the case that you still get a mixture of males and females in these cases. Okay, so that's another thing, of point number three. Go into the fourth variety, I believe the last. Okay, so there are some species, some species that are capable of asexual reproduction and, and many that aren't, and some that are, um, some that can switch between asexual and sexual reproduction. So. What is asexual reproduction? Well, this is the formation of an individual from an unfertilized egg. Unfertilized diploid egg, I should say. So you have mom, there's mom, that's a symbol for females. She produces a diploid egg that's genetically identical to her. It does not undergo meiosis, okay? It does not undergo recombination or um, independent assortment. And that egg grows up to be a daughter that's genetically identical to the mom. Okay, so genetic, this is, the, this is what we think about when we think about cloning. Okay, you make a bunch of individuals that are genetically identical to one another. Now, when I say genetically identical, I mean, uh, except for any mutations that happen to have occurred in, in the formation of this diploid uh, unfertilized egg, but for the most part, genetically identical. Now, in plants, this process of asexual reproduction is called apomixis. This is what we call it in, when, when plants do this. In animals, this is called parthenogenesis. You would think it would have been quite convenient from your perspective, especially if they could have just used the same name for the same process. Um, but of course, plant biologists have to call, it, call, call this phenomenon one thing, and vertebrate biologists have to call it something else. But it's the same basic idea. You're forming offspring that are genetically identical. This is something that, um, that can occur quite frequently. Um, there's, there's lizards, for instance, that are parthenogenic. Um, lots of plants that, are, uh, that undergo apomixis. Now, is there anything else I wanted to say here?
there a question? Yes. I'm sorry. My <laughs> at the best of times, my writing's not very good. Um, apo m i x i s. It's also in the notes. Hopefully spelled correctly. Yes. They're they're female. You're producing offspring that are they're all female. Because males don't produce offspring, <laughs> so that the one the one thing that I'm pretty certain of is that uh, males don't give birth um, or lay eggs. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious. I mean, being a little facetious, but but basically they're they're defined to be females because they can pr produce offspring, eggs that undergo uh, that that undergo growth, right? Um, so uh, they're defined to be females, but they're they're clearly a little bit different than the normal sexual rep sexually reproducing species. All the gametes are the same size in a sense. So w you know, by my definition that the females that always have the larger gametes, how does this work? They're just called female. Any other questions? Those were good questions. Yes. It's just how they, so it's not clear if it's beneficial or not. That's just the system that evolved. It's clearly not too detrimental. They, they seem to be able to, you know, about equal numbers of males and females are being produced in turtles and, and in crocodiles and, and alligators. So it's not, it doesn't seem to be a hindrance. It's just the mechanism by which they determine sex. I, I should say that I, I forgot to mention one thing when I was talking about hermaphroditic species. So I'm going to erase this portion of the board. Remarkable that I forgot this because it's the only thing I did as an undergraduate was research. And um, there are there are hermaphrodites that are sequential. So that is to say, um, you never find both sexes together in the same individual, but they undergo a sex change during their life. Right. Um, so there are some some species which are called protandrous hermaphrodites. These are male first. They go from male to female. And there's other uh, species that are called protagonists. I think I've got this right. They go from female to male. So an example of a protandrous species is, is um, actually can be found in the, in, in the intertidal area uh, in the Bay Area. So if you go to Half Moon Bay, for instance, and go out to maybe knee deep water and scoop up the sand, you'll find these little tiny clams. Everybody know what a clam is? The bivalves, they have two shells, they live in the dirt, they filter water and eat the gunk in the water. And these clams, um, they're called Transanella. That's the genus. Um, they, uh, they're very small. They're maybe five millimeters at, at, at the largest, so it's you know maybe a quarter inch in size. Um, and they go from male to female. They brood their young. The f so the, the clams that that uh, that come out of the female are fully formed clams. They're just little tiny guys. Um, there's probably an ecological explanation for proto protandrous and protagonist species. And in the clams, the argument is that. Um, you know, they're, they're so small, and, the, and because they're brooding, that you can't hold that many clams in this very small size. So it's the females that have more volume. They're the, big, the, they're the bigger individuals in the population. So it might be advantageous to be a female because um, when you're large, because you can, have, you can hold more offspring. And of course, sperm are very small, so you can, even as a small clam, you can produce a real excess of sperm. Okay? So that's the explanation you often see for um, uh, protandrous type species and protagonist species and examples are many reef fish are um, protagonists. And one of the arguments there is that some of these reef fish are territorial and where the males defend a territory, so perhaps it's advantageous to be uh, you know, bigger, to better defend your territory. So the males turn out to, to be the larger individuals. Anyways, it's, there's often ecological explanations associated with um, protandry and protogeny. There are some, just going back to the asexual and sexual, uh, capable of asexual reproduction, there are species too, just like there are species that, that can switch uh, sexes halfway through their life, there are species that can be, um, go through asexual or sexual reproduction, often depending on, upon the environment. They'll often go through asexual reproduction when the environment is stable 
and it's advantageous to undergo very rapid population growth, and they'll often be uh, sexual when things become more uncertain. Okay? Uh, things like aphids, I believe, are, are capable of asexual or sexual reproduction. Water fleas, Daphnia is another example of that. Now, I, I believe that's all I wanted to say about the variety, the different types of variety uh, of sexual reprodu or reproduction you actually see out there. I want to go on to the cost of being a sexually reproducing species. And so the first thing we have to realize is that there is a cost of undergoing sexual reproduction. And we, can, we might be able to list some of those costs. Um, erase this portion of the board. So what are the costs of, of sexual reproduction? Well, one cost is just you expend energy. So especially males and many species expend a large amount of energy just getting access to mates. Okay? So this, this idea of, of separating the sexes and undergoing sexual reproduction can be quite costly. There's also, uh, as you're probably familiar with, um, uh, potential for disease, picking up parasites. So there's a lot of parasites out there that have exploited sexual reproduction. We call them sexually transmitted diseases, but um, this is a potential cost of sexual reproduction. Okay. And the last thing, and the thing I want to talk about the most, is the so-called twofold cost of sex. So what is the twofold cost of sex? Well, to explain this, I want you to imagine two different populations of organisms. Let's go over here. One of the populations is asexual, and the other population undergoes normal sexual reproduction. And to simplify matters further, we're going to assume that in both cases, the asexual individuals and the sexual individuals, they, in both cases, they produce two, two offspring. Okay. Now, let's look at the, the sexual, the, rather, the asexual species. So here we have our female. And in this example, this female can produce two offspring, both of which are female. Okay. So the population in that one generation has doubled. Went from one individual to two individuals. Now each of these offspring are female, and because they're asexual, they don't need a male. So they can also produce two daughters. And we have now have four individuals. The population has doubled again. The point being that at asexual species, the, the population can double every generation in this, in this made up example because each individual uh, produces two offspring. Now let's, let's also imagine, so this is, the, this is the asexual. Now let's look at the, the sexual species. So here's our female. And as many, many of you females out there probably know, uh, males are pretty worthless as far as reproduction goes except to provide uh, fertilization for your eggs. So you need to find some male to reproduce with. And then this female, on average, is going to produce one female and one male offspring. Remember, we're keeping the, the game fair. You're, in both cases, they're producing two offspring. Now, this male doesn't do anything in terms of reproduction. It just pr provides a sperm for some egg, for some egg perhaps. Uh, so we won't worry about him. But this female here finds some mate, some male out there she mates with. Shouldn't be a problem. And she's going to produce, on average, one female, and she's going to produce one male, which is worthless as far as the reproduction goes. Okay. <laughs> so note that the population has not increased in size. It's going to remain stable. Now you're going to have two individuals. You know, this, this, it's gonna, this, this female, on average, is going to produce two offspring, one of which will produce two offspring, one of which will pr produce two offspring. The point here is that in asexual species, a population can grow quite rapidly. Whereas in a, a, a sexual species, because the sexual species are always producing these males, their population does not grow as quickly. Of course, the census, you go out there and count this, the population, of course, you're going to see males there, and they're going to count towards the population size, but they're not the ones that are producing the young. Okay. So that is the twofold cost of sex. 
So the question becomes, if sex is so bad, if it costs so much energy, you, you expose yourself to the risk of disease, and especially if you, if you imagine a, a, a species that uh, is asexual and compare it to the, the sexual ones, how can sex ever, ever evolve in the first place? And just to go back to this um, twofold cost of sex, I want you to imagine, you know, here's our population. Imagine that you have a sexually reproducing species. So here's each circle is a person or an individual. Okay, so we have our sexually reproducing species. It's composed of, say, randomly mating individuals. And imagine a mutation that causes some individual to all of a sudden not need, you know, not need to mate, right? So this individual now can reproduce asexually, whereas all the other individuals in the population um, are you know, obligatory uh, sexual. This individual is gonna, gonna produce females, both of which can reproduce, right? So this individual, just from what we know about population genetics, right? A mutation that causes an individual, that, that causes asexuality when it appears in a sexual species, it should spread, it should spread through the population, through natural selection. Okay. So why is it the case that we see so many sexually reproducing species? And it's a case that we don't just think that, that, um, that there's sort of an evenness between being asexual versus sexual. It's pretty clear that being sexual is better. Why do we think that? We think that because asexual species tend to be quite young. They don't persist very long. And we can tell that through what's called a, a phylogenetic analysis or a phylogenetic tree. You guys have gotten phylogenetic trees in lab? Yes, okay, so this shouldn't be too unfamiliar, but let's make a hypothetical tree. Maybe this is gonna be a tree of lizards, okay, and snakes. So here's our lizards and snakes. All of which are sexual at the tip, except what you tend to see are small parts of the tree that tend to be asexual. So maybe you'll find the whiptail lizards and there's some other lizards, for instance, that are asexual. They're not closely related to one another, and they're basically one asexual species surrounded by a bunch of sexual species. What does this mean? It means that asexuality must have arisen along that one twig. And, and it must arise quite common, often, because you actually see multiple species, multiple different species of lizards that are asexual, but you don't see one large, old group of asexual lizards. This means that asexual uh, species, when they're formed, don't last very long. They tend to go extinct at a higher rate than the sexual species do. There's one exception to this rule, uh, I should mention, just to be fair, and that's the deloid rotifers. They're uh, very small organisms that live in lakes. They're, they appear to be anciently asexual. They're the only group that we can think of that's like that. All the other cases that are known, the asexual species tend to be quite young. So what is the, you know, what is the advantage to being sexual? Because there must be some advantage or we wouldn't see so many sexual species. Everything should be asexual. Well, the evolution, so this is where I'm gonna actually go on to the evolutionary explanation. This is the last portion of this lecture. The evolutionary explanation for the advantage for sex has to do with um, these processes of, of recombination and, re and independent assortment that I talked about. And there's two different models. One is called Fisher's model, the Fisher model. And that is a model in which um, you adapt more rapidly to your environment. Okay, so that's one explanation. The other, and so you, you might know Fisher because he's that population geneticist that I'm so enamored with and that I mention all the time. And the other fellow was Muller. And this is um, uh, the explanation that sexual species can more easily purge deleterious mutations. Okay, so those are two different explanations. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time to explain both of these mechanisms. I, I should mention too that Muller um, was a, worked a lot in the 1930s. He's the fellow that discovered that um, radiation, for instance, uh, causes mutations in, in cancer. He got the Nobel Prize for that. And uh, people at university, he did all that research at the University of Texas at Austin, but
but then uh, he was he was expelled or kicked out of the university because he was a communist, but then he got his Nobel Prize after, afterwards when he was at another university. So Texas always likes to think, that, try to claim this Nobel Prize as, as their own, but it really isn't because they kicked him out. But anyway. So let's talk about um, the Fisher model. Talk about the Fisher model first. And the way I want to explain this is by looking at a population as a bunch of chromosomes. So here's our population. It's a bunch of chromosomes. And, oh, so there's our, there it is. And we all know what happens if you have a beneficial mutation land on one of these chromosomes. Right? So a star means it's a good mutation that the individuals that have that chromosome, that happen to have at least one copy of it, ha have a fitness advantage. They've survived better, they reproduce more offspring. What happens when we have a beneficial mutation? Natural selection tends to favor it. And you'll find more and more of the individuals in the population over time will tend to have that, that beneficial mutation. That's quite simple. You guys shouldn't be surprised by that result at all. Now, things become a little bit more complicated when we think about having beneficial mutations at a second locus. So let's imagine that there's a second locus where you can also have another gene, perhaps, where you can also uh, have a beneficial mutation land on that. So this individual, uh, you know, individuals bearing this chromosome also have a fitness advantage. Now, and let's uh, make, you know, make, make the example a little bit more interesting. If both of those mutations get onto the same chromosome, this individual is the best. So you have three different chromosomes, or four different chromosomes. You have the chromosome that doesn't have either of the beneficial mutations. Those are the worst. These guys that have one uh, beneficial mutation, they're better. And the guy that has the lucky chromosomes that have both mutations on them, they're the very best in terms of the fitness they confer on the individuals that bear them. Is the scenario clear? It's pretty simple. So best, good, worst. Now, in the absence of recombination, the only way to get both of those mutations together is to have this mutation land on a chromosome that already has that mutation. So you have, you, the only way you get this mutation with this one is that the mutation happens to occur right here with a beneficial mutation at the second position, the second locus. Um, when you don't have that occur, you have the mutations of occur on different chromosomes. And what happens? Well, these two chromosomes compete one against the other in the population. And ultimately, the winner will be determined by whether this, this mutation is better or worse than that mutation. Right? So in the absence of recombination, which is a process that you know, exchanges bits of the chromosome that can bring different uh, beneficial mutations together, in the absence of recombination, these mutations will either fight it out, compete one against the other in the population, with the ultimate winner being determined by which of these mutations has the higher fitness, or you have to wait till um, the second mutation arises on in the same background. And eventually, this double mutation will win. So when is it likely that both of these mutations will occur on the same chromosome? Well, it's going to occur when one of these two chromosomes, the chromosomes that have only one of them, one of the mutations, when lots of the individuals in the population are of that type, then when the second mutation occurs, then it's more likely to occur in the same background. So the general pattern in asexual species is that adaptation, when you consider multiple lo loci together, adaptation tends to occur sequentially. First one mutation occurs, one beneficial mutation occurs, it, it spreads to high frequency, and when it's at high frequency, then it's more likely that a second beneficial mutation will land in the same background. And then both mutations can spread to high frequency. So you can sort of see there would be a sequential fixation of the two mutations. First one gets high frequency, then you get the second mutation landing in the same background, and both can, can go to high frequency. Sexual species don't have to deal with that, right? They can bring through recombination these two beneficial mutations together, okay? So that they don't have to wait around for, uh, for one of the mutations to get to high frequency. These two, these two mutations can be at low frequency, and if they happen to be, if the two chromosomes happen to be in the same individual, and that individual undergoes recombination between those two, then it can form gametes that have both of those beneficial mutations together in the same chromosome. Are there any questions about this, this explanation? It's a basically an explanation for rap more rapid evolution uh, in, in a new environment.
That's Fisher's explanation. It's bringing together good mutations. Muller's model is a little bit different. And it, it involves deleterious mutations. So once again, I'm going to uh, illustrate our population with just as a series of chromosomes. Here's our population of chromosomes. And we can imagine that some of these chromosomes might be, uh, might have beneficial mutations somewhere. So those are the good mutations. But you can al also have deleterious mutations. That's a sad face. Okay, so there's a deleterious mutation that occurs somewhere else. So that is to say, this is the most, most mutations are deleterious, right? Only a rare, you know, only, only occasionally does a mutation actually make, improve things. Most of the time when you have a mutation, you break something that's already working just fine. So, in the absence of recombination, when this mutation occurs, well, natural selection tends to remove it from the population. Remember, we talked about purifying selection. When a deleterious mutation occurs by itself, this chromosome will have a lower fitness, and natural selection tends to remove those types of mutations through um, purifying selection, one of the processes I talked about when we talked about uh, natural selection. But you can also have situations like this where an otherwise perfectly good chromosome, or even a chromosome that would be quite good because it has a beneficial mutation, also happens to be associated with a deleterious mutation. In asexual species, there's no way of breaking up this association between a deleterious mutation and, and, a, and, a, and a beneficial mutation. It might be, for instance, that this is the worst chromosome because it has one deleterious mutation. This chromosome is intermediate in fitness. This one might be better than this one because it still has this beneficial mutation that outweighs this deleterious one. And of course, the very best chromosome is the one that doesn't have any deleterious mutations at all. So we'll call this the worst, better, better still, and best. Just to think about you know, assigning fitnesses to these different chromosomes. This would be the best scenario to be in, or it might be a, a, a chromosome that doesn't have any deleterious mutations associated with it, but has a beneficial one. Again, asexual species, because they don't undergo recombination, have no way of breaking up the association between the beneficial and deleterious mutation. Sexual species can recreate a kind of a pristine or a good chromosome by recombining uh, this mutation with a chromosome that doesn't bear that mutation. So for instance, a recombination event between these two chromosomes would be able to recreate this, this chromosome as well as that chromosome in the gamete. But at least it's reproducing a, you know, at least one variant of the chromosome that doesn't have that deleterious mutation. So this is um, Muller's explanation that purifying selection or that, that sexual reproduction uh, allows deleterious mutations to be more easily purged from a population. So that's the second, second explanation. And it's not clear which of these two factors, I mean, both of them are probably working in real, real life and in, in out in nature, but it's not clear, at least to me, which of these two um, processes is more important in terms of the evolutionary explanation for, for sex. But these are our best explanations for why sexual reproduction is so widespread in nature. Faster evolution and, uh, you know, more easily purging deleterious mutations. So that's all I wanted to say. This, uh, it's a lecture that's quite different than the one your parents gave you. See you next time. <laughs>